How about now? All right, thank you. So we're doing this steady state equations of motion. We need to figure out what P1, Q1, and R1, what expressions we use for those, and they come from the kinematic equations. So the first thing we're going to do is write down the kinematic equations. And then we're going to substitute in for the forces and moments. So we're talking about these terms over here. And we'll specialize those for a steady state turn. And then we'll talk about, well, how do we solve these equations? And again, we'll split them up into the longitudinal XZ and pitching moment equations, and then the lateral Y, roll, and yawing moment equations. So we'll need these force and moment equations here. So here's the lateral direction. Hey, Professor Stack, your mic isn't working. Yes? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. I surely hope the charge on this thing would have lasted longer than that. Let me plug it in and see if that's why it keeps going out. Remind me not to stand up with that plugged in. Can you hear me? We're good now? Yeah, all right. So we have the lateral directional forces and moments here, and then the traditional longitudinal forces and moments here, the lift drag, and the pitching moment, and the thrust forces. We've seen all these before. We'll add those to the equations and then talk about solving them. So let's go back to the notes, and we want to write uh, the conditions for the steady state term that we're going to put into those equations. So for the steady state level turn, the first thing we're gonna do is specialize this to steady state level. So that means the pitch angle and the flight path angle. Again, we're in stability axis, those are all zero. And then because we're in stability axis, W is zero. And then P, Q, and R are gonna come from the angular velocity vector. In a turn, we're rotating about the vertical axis because the airplane is banked like this, and it's rotating about a center of curvature over here, so it's making a turn like that, and we have a psi dot about that Earth-fixed vertical axis, the z-axis that points down. So the only component of the angular velocity vector is psi dot. 
think about this, does the bank angle of this airplane change as it goes around the turn? Steady state? No, it doesn't. It stays banked at a constant bank angle. So this is constant. V dot is zero. And then we've said theta is zero. There's no change in pitch angle. It's a level turn. And so theta dot is zero. Now those are steady state equations, so we don't have phi dot or theta dot. Sorry, we do have these in the kinematics, so we're going to be knocking those out. Um, bank angle's constant. Like I said, everything else. So we're going to go to the kinematic equations, which are going to tell us what P Q and R should be written as. So this is the, these are the kinematic equations from chapter one. <clears throat> and so we need to apply the steady state turn condition that we listed above, that theta dot and phi dot are zero, that psi dot is not. And remember for steady state, we say u dot v dot w dot are zero and p dot q dot r dot are zero, but we never said that phi dot, the angular, angles, the Euler angles are constant, but for a turn, some of those are. So we're going to knock out phi dot because the bank angle does not change. And then we're level flight. So that's zero. So there is no roll rate. If you're thinking about it, again, P, Q, and R are in the viewpoint of the observer as a pilot. If you're sitting in the airplane, you don't see any roll. You're at constant bank angle, level, turn, there is no roll. So theta dot, we said we're level flight, so that's zero. Cosine is one. Bank angle's not zero, so we have to leave that sign in there. And psi, you need a one on here, psi dot is not zero. That's the steady state turn. So R is given by this much simpler expression for the turn. And then we're going to do the same thing for that's Q. R is going to be given by the cosine is zero. You gotta leave the bank angle in there because it's not any value we're gonna specify that, but theta one dot is zero. So what this says is that Q and R are determined by the turn rate. That is how quickly you're turning, which is psi dot, and the bank angle of the airplane. So in the previous equations, we're going to plug in values for these. But we'll want to express psi dot a little bit better, so we'll work on that in a minute. But I want to draw a vector diagram of ex how this expresses psi dot in the x and z of the y and z coordinates because we just looked at and plugged in the equations but i think it's good to look at the picture the physical picture of what's going on let me know if i'm scrolling up too fast so 
So draw the picture that we were working on earlier. Draw an airplane over here at a bank angle. Phi, so this is the horizon through here. And here's the center of the turn. And so we have a vector psi one dot that's the angular velocity vector. So this is omega. So if we look at the z and y axis of the airplane, we can project that psi dot on to that axis system. So there's psi one dot, that's the vector. And this is the angle phi. So this is angle phi. So I'll scoot that up so it's easier to see. And we'll simply take components of psi one dot along the z and the x axis, or the z and the y axis. And if you look at the component of psi one dot along the y axis, so we're talking about that component there, that is psi one dot sine of phi. And if you look at the component of it along the z axis, that is psi one dot cosine phi. All right, all it is is we're just taking the vector omega, which is psi one dot, pointed straight down, and we're taking components of it along the y and the z direction. So this vector here that I've drawn kind of in the wrong angle, that should be parallel to y. Sorry, I botched that up. So the component of the angular velocity about the z-axis is the yaw rate by definition. The angular velocity about the z-axis is the yaw rate. And the angular velocity around the y-axis, that's nose up and nose down, that's pitch rate. All right, so we're just doing vector algebra here. And then remembering that the angular velocity here is what we call Q1, and the angular velocity about this axis is what we call R1. But if you look at the equations above, that's exactly what those equations said. R1 is psi dot cosine, Q1 is psi dot sine. So really the kinematic equations, because they come from the, the definitions of the Euler angles, are simply telling us, well, what angular velocities in the Euler rate, psi, theta, and phi dot, are projected into P, Q, and R. That's what those equations do. So it makes sense that our diagram here, because we just have one simple vector, it gives us the answers we got from the kinematic equations. But from this picture, it's important to understand that we really have the airplane doing an angular rate motion about a center of curvature. So it's really circular motion from basic physics, which means that to do for a mass to follow a curved path, we need some kind of a centrally acting force to make it go on a curved path. And Sir Isaac Newton taught us that, what, in the 1500s, right? An object in motion stays in motion in a straight line unless acted upon by a force. A force in the direction of the velocity increases or decreases the velocity. A force perpendicular to the velocity changes the, the path. All right, so that's a little bit of physics and a drawing and vector algebra here. We want to go back to the equations of motion.
Is everybody finished getting this down? Everybody good? All right. So we're going to put in the steady state forces and moments. The one thing that we need to add is in those steady state forces and moments, we don't have, for example, a lift due to pitch rate. Our CL model is CL0 plus CL alpha plus CL delta E plus CL IH. So we need to add this in because now we have a pitch rate. And we'll look at this in more detail when we jump back to chapter three. But if you think about an airplane, pitching about the CG with a pitch rate Q1, the horizontal tail will be sweeping downward. And so there will be a relative airflow upward. And that's going to push on the horizontal tail. And it's going to generate an additional lift due to that pitch rate. And it will generate an additional pitching moment and possibly additional drag. So we're going to add additional terms. This is the CL due to pitch rate. And it's calculated with respect to the special non-dimensional pitch rate that we'll talk about later and define. We're just going to take it for granted right now. And we'll have to add in a similar term for CM. And then we have, so we'll have a CMQ times the same thing. And then we have a yaw rate. So we'll also get a yaw rate effect. We'll get a yawing moment due to the yaw rate. And we'll get a rolling moment due to the yaw rate. So we're going to add all of these extra effects. All right, I'm going to jump to the board because I'm hoping it's going to be easier to see and easier for me to write clearly the full set of equations on the board. I encourage you to copy these down. Let me give you a minute to catch up. And we'll see if I got enough charge on my microphone here to last at least for 10 minutes while I do this. Are you still hearing me on Zoom? Okay, let me know if I drop out and I'll come back and plug in. All right, first, the uh, drag equation. So again, I'm going back to that first page I showed you out of the book, and then we're grabbing the forces and moment models from those other two pages.
So this should look familiar. Here's the gravity vector in the x direction. Sorry, yeah, in the x direction. These are the steady state terms on the left side. And then here's our drag model. And then here's the thrust. In fact, this looks exactly like what we used for the rectilinear flight problem, except we've kept these terms over here with the rates. But remember, we said that W is zero, but we have to keep R. So that's going to give us an extra term that we did not have when we did the straight and level cruise condition. And we have to do this for all of the other equations. Here's the side force. Make sure I have enough room here. I think I'll be good here. It's okay if I erase this CD, it's getting in my way. Good. So there's our side force model. Notice that we've added this. That's our side force due to R. We did not include a CDQ up here because he says in the book this is pretty much small. There's not a whole lot of drag due to the pitch rate, so we're not going to include that. And then here's our thrust effect here. And uh, I forgot to do this up here, but remember we said we're at level turn, so the cosine is going to be 1, and the sine is going to be 0, so we could knock that out. So if you want to label this, but level turn, we did that, and we did that. So we're not climbing or diving in this turn, we're just turning around. And then again, W is zero, so we can knock that out, but we can't knock R out because R is part of the psi dot velocity. And then we have the lift equation. And so there's our lift model. Notice that we added some lift due to the pitch rate here. But other than that, it's similar to what we did for level flight, for rectilinear flight. And we can knock out P1 here because there's no bank angle change, no roll rate. And I hope you're copying these in your notes. And then you may be grumbling to yourself, 
why the heck do we have to write this? Why is Dr. Steck writing this on the board and we're writing it on our pieces of paper? Several reasons. One, hopefully it keeps you awake in class. The second reason is when you write it down, you focus on each term individually, and so you'll remember it. And that will help embed it in your brain. And you will maybe memorize these by the time we're done with class. And who knows, you may impress your boss later down the road if you can say, oh yeah, I remember these terms go in the lift model for the steady state flight. And you can impress your boss. Hopefully you don't wake up in the middle of the night dreaming about these equations. I hope it doesn't <laughs> cause that to happen. But. All right, so we can see these equations here, and then we've got the roll, pitch, and yaw equations left to do. So we're almost there, a little more than halfway. So here's the roll equation. So here's our rolling moment model. It depends on beta. We've added this term here, because now we're turning. Aileron and rudder are normal, and there's the thrust effect. And P1 is zero, so we can knock this out, but not R1 and Q1. And then here's the pitching equation. And here's our pitching moment model. It depends upon angle of attack. And a new term, Q. So this is a new term here that we added. And we need to go over here and knock out our P's. How's the battery on my microphone holding out? Still hearing? Okay. And here's the yaw equation. And we'll start making some approximations as we need to knock out P here. Here's a new term, so we added this. 
But we are going to say, okay, the side force due to the thrust is small. So note that. We're going to say that there's not a whole lot of rolling, rolling moment due to the thrust, or not a whole lot of yawing moment. So we're assuming that we're doing this turn with both engines working just fine. There's no asymmetrical thrust in what we're doing. And just like with the longitudinal and lateral directional equations for the, the, uh, the rectilinear flight, the cruise, we have the same unknowns. We've got alpha and elevator. We're going to specify IH, the tail setting angle. An unknown is going to be thrust. Aileron and rudder are going to be unknowns. And beta will be an unknown. And remember, R1, you say, well, those are unknowns, like R1 and, and Q1. But remember, those are going to be specified by the turn rate from the kinematic equations. So we get the kinematic equations give us Q1, P1, and R1. So they're not unknowns. But we do have aileron, rudder, beta, so that's three. Alpha, elevator, and thrust. So we're still going to specify bank angle here. So that's not an unknown. So if we specify the bank angle, we specify the velocity, which gives us Q, and we specify IH, then we have six equations and six unknowns. So let's write that. I want to leave these equations up on the board. I'm going to jump back to the tablet here. So I'll give you a minute to get caught up on that as well. And all this stuff is in your book as well but it doesn't show the working through of knocking stuff out. So that's another reason to have you write it down. So how are we doing on writing this down? Anybody working on it? Just don't be shy. Say, hang on a second. You still writing? Okay. And before we switch away from this, I want to mark two things. I want you to look at this term here, MU1R1. And this is MU1Q1. Because I'm going to draw a picture here in a minute. And I'm going to show you that these two are components of the centrally acting force that's required to do the turn. This is going to be that projected onto the z-axis, and this is going to be that projected onto the y-axis. So these are the two components of the centrally acting force that we need to do the turn. So we're going to draw a free body diagram of the forces, which is going to have gravity on it, and the lift. We're not looking at drag because that's perpendicular. We're going to look at the lift, the gravity, 
and then the centrally acting force that we need to do the turn. All right, to recap what we set up there, we're going to specify the forward velocity. Oh, I don't know what I wrote. Specify. Can I squeeze a P in there? I wonder if that's a real word. The bank angle and the tail setting angle. So that's what we did to knock out those unknowns. And they make sense. We're going to say we're going to do a 45 degree bank turn, which will actually be related to the load factor. We'll show that. And it makes sense to say, Okay, we're flying at 150 knots when we do this turn. We can choose that as a pilot, and so that's going to give us the dynamic pressure. And then remember the kinematic equations give us Q1 and R1. So they're not unknowns, and P1, we found out, is zero for the turn. So we're going to solve for alpha, elevator, and thrust. You look up at the equations on the board, I guess you can't see them unless you're in here. But remember, we have those thrust cosine and thrust sine terms, so we're going to have to make an approximation just like we did before to get rid of those sine and cosine terms. And then we're going to solve for beta, aileron, and rudder, just like we did for the one engine in operative condition. Remember for that, we needed rudder to counteract the engine yaw, and then we needed aileron to counteract the roll, and then we got some beta along the way. Same thing's going to happen here, because not because the thrust is asymmetrical, but because the turn rates, R and Q, give us those additional terms in the equations that are going to require some rudder. All right. A very key component or concept, not component, concept here is this right here. So I'm going to write it big. Let's write it big and green. We're going to assume a coordinated And here's the definition of a coordinated turn. And if you remember this, you will be able to win discussions or even arguments amongst engineers as to what a coordinated turn is, or even pilots. A coordinated turn, although it turns out is pretty close to being approximately correct, is not zero side slip. Although if you use a tuft on a glider to detect side slip, you can almost coordinate the turn most of the time by trying to get close to zero side slip. But the official definition 
of a coordinated turn, not just according to me, but according to everybody, is that there is no lateral or side force or acceleration. And if you think of the whole idea of a coordinated turn, if you're sitting in your seat in the airplane and the plane is banked, you don't feel like your body is being thrown to the left or the right. And that is the definition of a coordinated turn. There is no net force on you. And what it boils down to is that the gravity vector of you being banked that's pulling on you provides exactly what you need to do the circular motion. So the component of the gravity vector sideways gives you what you need to do the circular motion. Okay, think about driving a car. You're on the interstate and you do a sharp turn and there's no bank to the turn. You feel thrown to the outside of the turn because there is no bank and there is no gravity vector providing that centrally acting force to make the turn. And so your seat provides that force. Makes sense, right? So on a racetrack, they bank the turn so that if you go through the bank turn at just the right speed, the bank provides that force and you are coordinated during the turn. If you go faster or slower, then you get some side force as well. So what does that mean as far as equations? It means that if we look at just the side force equation, that the total net side force is zero, which is what we set up there, or writing this equation here, it says that the gravity provides, and I'm going to show you that this is that centrally acting force component we need, gravity provides this central force needed. And because of the side force equation, the other half of this, the right hand side of the equation, is Cy beta, Cy delta, no, it's not delta R, Cy R, I should erase that because I know how to erase now, right? So this concept and equation may be one of the most valuable things I think you learn from this class is the definition of a coordinated turn. Is that there is no side force on the equation, on the airplane. And again, the key is remembering this. It says that gravity provides the centrally acting force needed to do the turn. So maybe we ought to add that. Again, it is not zero beta. It's close to zero. We'll see when we actually solve some numerical problems. So I'm going to leave that up there for a minute. I'm going to give everybody, including me, a five-minute break. Uh, because the next picture that I'm going to take is pretty detailed and I want you to focus on it because it shows exactly what we are doing with this coordinated turn. And then I think we'll have one more step after that and we'll call it good for the day. The what?
Yeah, you can drift through it. Right? Yeah, the tires, well, the tires are providing the side force, but then the car is still going to be pushing on you. Yeah, I mean, you do Yeah. Now you're right. I mean, if you're not coordinated on the, in the car, then the tires are providing the extra side force that you don't have. If you exceed that, then the tires break free from the pavement. Where do I stand up? Take a breath. Are you drinking water? All right, here we go with our picture. So draw this big. Need an airplane over here. And then here's the center of the turn. And so the turn radius is that distance over there. And the forces acting on the airplane are gravity and lift. And then we need, this is the centripetal force that's needed, so we're going to look at what's providing this. It's mu1 psi1 dot, which is the same thing as m 
u1 squared over the radius of the turn. Because the angular velocity is simply u over the radius. It's just circular motion about a circle. All right, so we're gonna take components of the lift and the gravity and this required force and put them in the x and z axis. Because right now, the central acting force is in the body, not the body, the earth fixed axis system. So here goes. This angle here is phi, the bank angle. So the component of m u1 psi1 dot in this direction is m u1 psi1 dot cosine phi but going back to the kinematic equations That's R1. And that's the term that shows up in the side force equation where we had MU1R1 minus MG sine of phi equal to zero. That was the coordinated turn condition so ne next we're going to draw gravity, but let's finish the components because we're going to have a component of that required force in this direction as well. So I want to write that. And that's mu1 psi1 dot sine of phi. And that's q. All right, so now I want to take components of the gravity. So let's do that in a different color. So we're going to take a component of the gravity in this direction. And in this direction. And so this side force equation says exactly that this required acceleration to do the turn is provided by this component of the gravity. And so that gives you no net side force. You don't feel the gravity in the bank acting on you because you need that to do the turn. And then what's going on in the vertical direction the other component of gravity subtracted from the lift, so lift minus mg cosine phi provides this other component of the centrally acting force. So what I've drawn here is we've looked at the centrally acting force in the body fixed axis because that's what Q and R are. They're in the body fixed axis. And I've pushed the, the weight vector into the body fixed axis so that we can compare it to these terms that we see in the equations of motion that are the body fixed equations of motion. And so if you look at the lift equation, you see this other term MU1Q1 up on the board you look up there, I know, you, you, hopefully you have it in the notes, the third equation has MU1Q1, uh, and that gets added to the lift to balance the gravity vector, um, to, to give the centrally acting force. 
Now the other way to look at this I want another color here. Should we be K-State today? What do I got? Okay, I got a purple line, that's good. So let's look at the component of the lift vector and now we're talking about in the Earth fixed axis. So the previous stuff we're talking about, we did components in the body fixed axis Let's see what kind of insight we can get in the earth fixed axis system. So this is phi. This is L sine phi. This is L cosine phi. I guess I missed an opportunity to use, choose shocker gold here, didn't I? Shocker yellow. Well, we'll do that another time. So there are components of the lift in the earth fixed axis system. And this is, in fact, easier because now we can say, well, in the earth fixed axis, not body fixed, because we already looked at that, this component of the lift balances gravity. So L cosine phi1 balances mg. That makes sense. We just need enough lift to keep us in the air. And then this component of the lift provides the centrally acting force. And that's the more natural way to look at the physics or the dynamics of this is in the earth fixed axis because that's where the motion is. And so this is easy, lift, the component of the lift balances gravity, the other component gives you the centrally acting force. The reason I did the body fixed axis system, again, is because these terms appear in the body fixed axis equations and I wanted to see to show you where they come from, and the coordinated turn definition is in the side force direction, which is a body fixed y axis. So we looked at it both ways, but perhaps we ought to write these down. So in the aircraft axis, MU1R1 is provided by. mg sine phi. In the advertising world, we'll say that mg sine phi is sponsoring this term, right? And in the vertical direction, mu1q1 is provided by that lift difference. And then we talked about in the Earth fixed axis system, Then we said that mu1 psi1 dot, that's the total centrally acting force, is sponsored by L and the total weight is counteracted by L cosine. And in fact, this is where we come up with our definition of load factor as we divide both sides by mg, which is weight, So lift over weight is defined to be load factor. Not just because we want to call it something, well maybe that is, is that lift over weight shows up in the dynamic equation here. And in fact, as a pilot you feel that, you feel like the seat is pushing on you with more force than your weight. And so we call it G's or load factor. 
So again, these are the two different ways axis systems to look at the turn and the physics of what's going on. These terms show up in the body fixed equations. These show up if you're looking at things in the earth fixed axis system. So that's a good place to stop. We're going to have to go back to the kinematic equations and calculate R and Q in terms of bank angle and load factor, but we'll leave that for next time. Oh, some announcements before we get away. Uh, there's homework number five. That's due on October 12th. You guys have your flight test. That's due this Thursday, which is what, October 1st? And then we're going to do the next exam on October 8th. So that's next Thursday. And again, it's going to be 30 minutes, part closed book, part open book, same open book. The, this covers. It's on the syllabus, right? It covers through uh, the, the longitudinal trim and the lateral trim. So this does not include this stuff today. In fact, uh, now I'm remembering it doesn't include lateral trim either because you haven't done a homework on that. That's on the current homework, the new homework. So it's up to the longitudinal trim problem. I'll verify that, but I'm pretty sure that that's right. It does not include maneuvering flight. Let me check to see if it's going to include the lateral directional or not. All right, that's it. Have a good evening.